Previously on Necro 13. So, in conclusion, not only are literal translations the weakest kind of translations, but also because they're intentionally devoid of localization, it can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get them to even fit within the medium of whatever's being translated. You literally added more words to your localization to make an example. In short, they're a bad idea on all fronts. Okay, so at this point we've talked about translation and why you don't actually want literal ones. We've talked about localization and how it's not actually as scary as most people think. Meaning that, at long last, it's time to talk about... Another one of these quotes... I didn't realize that people couldn't point to the reason they didn't like Funimation a company formerly beloved by the masses, but now shunned by them. Dragon Maid isn't the first, and it's not the last example. Overseas anime fans saw tons of blatant censorship in anime back when hack dubs were at their peak in the 90s and early 2000s. This includes, but obviously isn't limited to, one of the most ridiculous instances of LGBTQIA plus erasure in television history. How'd you guys meet then? We're cousins. We grew up together. Huh? We've been inseparable huh? since we were born. We can almost read each other's minds. Like best friends? They seem to be very good friends. Firstly, hack dubs are still localization. The show remained the same. Also, it got remade, so who really cares? Secondly, uh, censorship is never acceptable. Anime companies do it, and it's awful, no matter the capacity they do it in. But in the post 4 kids world where hack dubs are exponentially more rare and companies generally worry less, if at all, about conforming to TV rating rules, the nature of what censorship can look like in translated media, but anime especially, has changed a lot. Specifically, we're going to talk about censorship as it relates to translated scripts. Visual censors or content changes are a whole other can of worms. Why? You were fine bringing up the Japanese media as a whole earlier, and now that it has you pinned, you don't want to confront it. Well, allow me to. In your words, those censors weren't that. They were localized. Because if we look at the statements from companies you defend, they call it localization. They have to speak to the app stores they put their products out on. Nothing changed here except the product. But anyways, for a lot of people, the turning point for the next era of censorship in anime was Funimation's Prison School dub. Specifically, it was an instance where Gamergate was referenced. Whoa, pump the brakes, Arthur Fonzarelli. Have you got a stick up your ass? Or are you one of those dumbass Gamergate creep shows? <laughs> I don't think that we need to retread old ground here, but I think that there's a video for that. Yeah, not a lot of people were big fans of this, and they claimed that Funimation was needlessly injecting politics into their translations. What other reason would they need? I can't come to think of anything else that would have popped into their brains to put that line in there other than the localization team wanted to be antagonistic towards their audience, which isn't the first time Funimation got caught doing the same thing back in 2012. The controversial line was eventually removed in later releases, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people forgave them for this. Have you got a stick up your ass? Or is that your pathetic attempt at talking to an older girl? <laughs> in fact, it actually had the opposite effect. Moments like it and Dragon Maid's infamous patriarchy scene seem to be at the root of a school of thought that started to emerge that this is censorship that's meant to promote a left-leaning political agenda and that it's an industry-wide problem that happens fairly fairly often, or at the very least that it's a problem within Funimation, who, in fairness, is one of the largest influences within the western anime industry. What are you wearing that for? Oh, those pesky patriarchal societal demands were getting on my nerves, so I changed clothes. Funimation, besides those two series, also had their hand at localization, with My First Girlfriend is a Gal, where they were, again, antagonistic towards their audience with their light novel line. Dragon Maid, by Funimation, was and is controversial because of the staff being rude to their audience in person as well. Oh, uh, I'm kind of scared to ask this question now because they don't want to bring them in the room. Um, uh -oh, so okay. this is more directed at Jamie, but all of you can answer. Go, Jamie, all of you go. I'm excited like, uh, about it. I'm ready to bring down the room. Let's do we it. We need a spotlight. Um, so I'm Funimation Jamie. has come under, let's call it, criticism oh, for how they choose to adapt their scripts oh, for like a couple of shows. Oh, like unnecessary hate. Yeah, got it. Yeah, um... And a lot of that, I feel, is directed at you unfairly. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> so how would you like to respond to that kind of criticism? To the criticism? Like, I have a vagina. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> 
like, it's honestly, that's the truth. Uh, I am a woman. I am a funny woman. We are all talented, funny, powerful women. We are out here. It's going to happen. Deal with it. I'm sorry you're not getting laid. It's not about you. Move on. Don't worry, I'll link the rest of it below, I and mean, it's going to go to a tweet, which is all that we really got because the video is now gone. It may or may not give you any more information than you already wanted or needed, but it does at least give you the insight on who these people are that do all of your localizations are. If we're gonna be totally honest here, not all, but the overwhelming majority of these criticisms and accusations are made in bad faith. How exactly? Everything that you bring up is going to be countered by it actually existing. So if it's really bad faith, then why in the world do you keep bringing up something that debunks yourself? As evidenced by the fact that they're almost always made anytime woke language makes its way into a translation. Example A. Apparently, the word misogyny is too political for anime. The reason it got brought up was because of the change of the original terminology. You could say woke language, but it's really the change that was needless to begin with. Old fashioned isn't nearly as damaging as misogynistic. They mean two completely different things. Also, no one said it was too political for anime. I mean, have you ever seen Sinfo Gear? It's pretty much America bad. Example B. I, the Somnium Files, got a ton of backlash because a lot of people thought that this compliment toward the LGBTQIA plus community must have been shoehorned into the game by its localization team. Plot twist, this was also in the Japanese version. A lot of people. You showed three. One of them used the word SJW, which is cringe in current year, and also, it's still not emblematic of the entire fanbase that may or may not want it to have played the game. The second is a Steam forum post wanting to know more about their product before purchase, which, to be fair, the argument could be made that he didn't want politics he didn't like in it, but in his post, he wasn't nearly as aggressive as the last example. And lastly, the person in this post never said one way or another what made them not want the game, and we can go even as far as to say that no matter what the politics were, he still didn't want them in the game he didn't buy. The video that you used as evidence for this was posted by just a random account, which we can almost assume is probably a sock puppet account, but I'm not here to pass judgment one way or another. But again, this is something that is restricted only to this part, and again, it only had mixed reviews, not completely negative. In addition, you could say the woke crowd get upset by the mere thought that a villainous character might be a reference to someone right-leaning they don't like. This, kids, is when I found out identity politics were terrible. LGBT Alright, so one line in a video game that no one really cared about. Because the game is still very positively received, so it's almost like this is selective in that you're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel to get this one, uh, kind of example out. Yeah, generally, all of these bad faith criticisms absolutely crumble in the face of their scene's context or even just a proper understanding of things like translation and the dubbing process, which, as I mentioned earlier, requires mouth flaps to be matched. In fact, if you want to learn more about this issue as it relates to dubbing anime specifically, I would highly recommend the Cartoon Ciphers Our English Dub Censoring Anime video, which, you guessed it, I'll leave on the end card and in the description. Because one YouTuber agreed with me and said it. It must be true. In any case, yeah, the house in Fata Morgana. I can't believe that you have to make me go here and defend, somewhat, the one angry gamer, or also known as Billy. So, the house in Fata Morgana had a western localization change from Sundere over to Fragile Male Ego, which, by the way, don't mean anything close to the same thing. Even then, the person that translated everything and localized it even said that they have no fucking idea how many brainstorming sessions it took over several weeks to come up with this translation. And it, again, makes no sense because Sundere usually means that they're a person that is pretty cold and distant, but they eventually start to uh, get a little bit warmer and they have a much sweeter side. Whereas with Fragile Male Ego, that doesn't really just, it doesn't, it's not the same thing. 
Bofury. Funimation edits joke to remove light sexual humor in Bofury. I don't want to get hurt, so I'll max out my defense. <laughs> What are your thoughts about the event? Oh, uh, well, it was tough, but I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> did she just say happy? Sure did. As the article that you saw says, while both sets of dialogue and performances convey the same emotions, the original dialogue presents more reason for embarrassment than the dub version does. To love Rue, these are only a few of the many instances of bad faith accusations that crumble when you learn about things like context and the translation and dubbing process. Well, if that's only the few of the many, then let's take a look at a couple more then. In the anime you know, a girl who chants love at the bound of this world is actually edited by Funimation themselves by removing a line to include you're such a misogynist. <laughs> おやびに竹つんつんなんですよね。あ、島津さん。よ。お嬢様。その呼び方、よしてちょうだい。じゃあ、学園アイドルみよちゃん。なんでこんなにイライラするのかしら。さあな。あの日なんじゃないのか。な
Yeah, let's think back to that really hard. I know it was a little while ago, but it might help you out in this case. I'll direct you toward getting the robots queer erasure in Eva video if you want to learn more about that. I'm about to start shilling some other people's videos because more often than not, it's like they spend like 30 minutes not getting their own sources and they say, hey, this YouTuber knows and, and they'll present my evidence for me so I won't have to. I mean, I can do that too, but I'm not lazy and I'm not going to try to go somewhere else for all of this info. Again, in the end card and in the description. But anyways, back to my main point. Almost every translator, editor, and ADR director that I spoke to was quick to point out that even if they wanted to use their work to promote an agenda, between the eyes of their editors, actors, directors, and the fans, it'd be extremely hard for them to get away with it, and that's to say nothing of the tremendous risk they'd be putting their career at. And all for what? To change the wording slightly in a single scene? While I can't point out everything that's wrong with your clubhouse mentality, um, it does still happen, even though it may not be in the numbers that you think that it is. But you know what they say behind closed doors. To quote Nathaniel Hiroshi Thrasher, to realistically promote an agenda, you need the story to support it on a thematic level. Otherwise, it's just a bumper sticker, and literally nobody has ever had their mind changed by a bumper sticker. People have had their lives changed from less. People can just wake up one day and self-reflect because they saw someone else doing a thing. Change can happen, no matter how big or small. Whether it's coming from a business or a fan subbing group, a translation is an interpretation of the original language. And by virtue of being an interpretation, even the best translations can never give you a 100% authentic experience the same way already knowing the original language can. And I know that sounds scary, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that when something is translated, there's always going to be room for interpretation, which is always going to put a bit of a disconnect between the versions in the original language language and the translated language. That's just natural. There will always be a disconnect. People will never be able to truly understand one another, even in their own language. Why do you think Reddit exists? This is also why different translators will hardly ever produce identical results. Things like their unconscious bias will come into play, which can only further muddy these already messy waters. So, to sum up this section of the video, I guess, the presence of censorship and agenda pushing in translation is a pretty nuanced issue because there's just never any two situations which are perfectly identical and, as we've already discussed, translation isn't some machine process where every word will always fit perfectly. You know, it's messy, it's misunderstood, and nobody's gonna get it right every single time. That's their job, Red. Their job is to translate and someone else's job to localize it. If you don't do your job, then I'm sorry, get a new one. It sucks, but that's just the way it is. Not all, but certainly most censorship and agenda pushing accusations are made either in bad faith or just from a lack of understanding. And also, sometimes people are just looking for an excuse to dunk on Funimation. How? With that many examples and their context, Funimation has every right to get dunked on. You don't have to look for an excuse or a reason that they do it almost monthly. They do it and they get caught in 4K. Obviously, I don't have time to sit here and pick apart every single case of these accusations being made, but hopefully I've equipped you with enough knowledge to look at them more effectively when you encounter them. You didn't. You had all the time in the world, and you didn't. So I did. So now that you hopefully have a much better understanding of translation, localization, and censorship, and what they actually are and aren't, hopefully you'll bring that knowledge with you next time you see a questionable translation. As a reminder, it's always worth getting context before you judge whether or not a translation choice is particularly good or bad, but regardless of how you feel about a translation, you should still never threaten or harass the translators, editors, or ADR directors over it. I do agree, probably for the first time in this video, but you shouldn't do anything like that to people who do translations or localizations. If you have an issue, vent your concern via the proper channels or Twitter. But don't harass, threaten, or harm these people because they got a word wrong in your visual novel about how cute your sister is. Not only is this just pointless and aggressive, but frankly, translators generally have enough problems even without taking into account messages from angry people on the internet who probably haven't even familiarized themselves with the work that they're criticizing. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of those people who only watch Marvel movies and then deny greatness of other films. Imagine being able to care about two things at once. 
while censorship and agenda pushing are definitely the most complained about aspects regarding the translation industry, they really shouldn't be. Not just because, well, as I've hopefully just taught you, it's generally just nonsense, but also because of the abysmal state of pay and credit within the industry. It's not my fault or anyone that's a consumer's fault that the industry doesn't work properly for these people. We don't work there, so we don't know what happens and if even things get accomplished or not. It is extremely difficult to make a livable wage solely off of translating Japanese media. It is in fact a low paying job, but you have to also remember that a lot of the people that do these specifically for things like Crunchyroll, they live in the Bay Area or LA, so probably don't live in those cities. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. In fact, by the standards of most U.S. cities, it'd be downright impossible for all but a small number of them. The Canapa Effect has an absolutely fantastic video that goes more in depth on this problem as it relates to Crunchyroll, who, while they're certainly not alone in hardly paying their translators, are nonetheless by far the biggest offenders of this, with their standard pay being $80 per episode. Ah, the Canapa Effect. The guy that says stupid stuff on the internet who can't take criticism is going to tell me about the industry. But on the main topic, Crunchyroll did get called out by fans. Guess what changed? Oh, that's right. Nothing changed. This isn't only an obviously low number in general, but it's also nowhere near proportional to the amount of time and effort that generally goes into a single episode, which can range from a few hours to a whole day. And remember, a lot of these are simulcast subs, so these translators are on a super tight deadline all the while. I'll leave a link to this video on the end card and in the description, because I would definitely recommend giving this one a watch. It's extremely informative, and frankly, with Crunchyroll setting themselves up to be the largest name in anime exclusive streaming, it's especially important for them to be leading by example. Fuck Crunchyroll. Also, by the way, that video is coming out in May. That being said, just to clarify, Crunchyroll is not the only company that's known for not paying their translators very much. Even Sentai, Funimation, Netflix, God, pretty much any streaming service that you can think of, none of them are known for paying their translators particularly well. It's just that Crunchyroll here is a particularly appalling case. Again, they need to either unionize or strike for better pay. If shills like Mother's Basement can work for Crunchyroll and then tell Amazon workers to strike, then he can demand change for his company. But I guess if the boot tastes good, then why bother? In fact, Canapa told me that in the aftermath of his video, which at the time of writing this has almost half a million views, translators have been sharing the video among their communities and prompted the sharing of even more information. In the future, more translators will apply for Crunchyroll while knowing that they're worth so much more. Then why would they apply for Crunchyroll knowing that they're going to get paid probably just an unlivable wage? Why would they do that? Just a food for thought question. But you know, I cannot talk about the low pay trend throughout the industry without also bringing up something huge that really hit the public's attention literally as I was wrapping up this script, and that's Amimaru. More specifically, it's the fact that it was recently publicized that they've been paying their typesetters a rate of a dollar per page. Yeah, a dollar per page. And if that sounds ridiculous to you, uh, good. It should sound like that because it is. Oh, that sounds terrible and even worse than Crunchyroll. I'm sure that this business that is definitely a parasite on the entire industry probably is out of business by now, right? I don't want to dwell on this for too terribly long because really, if I wanted to, I could make an entirely separate video about Amimaru drama because believe me, there's plenty to say about it. But the short version of the story is that Amimaru is a business that employs people from all over the globe to translate manga. Notably, they've been known to be contracted by Kodansha, Futekia, and Manga Planet, among other companies. But Kodansha is nonetheless the main one that I want to draw your attention to since, as a reminder, it's one of the largest publishers in Japan. An anonymous Futekia employee emphasized to me that one, Amimaru generally isn't well liked, even within the industry, and two, while Futekia, Manga Planet, and Kodansha have all contracted translation work from Amimaru, that doesn't make their freelancers employees of any of the aforementioned brands. Or more specifically, they couldn't be even if they wanted to, since Amimaru makes its freelancers sign either a non solicitation or non compete clause. Again, if this sounds ridiculous, it's because it is. So knowing that this is a Japanese thing as well, what do the workers do? Well, I'm going to tell you a story of something similar to this right now. 
Many years ago, I was working for a car company and I had had a great time there. I was I was working, I was doing my job, and everything was great. I was getting paid very well, as a matter of fact. But what ended up happening was we had an influx of new people. They came into the job and I was able to train them and teach them a little bit of the nuances around the work area. And one of the things that happened was our management. They decided that they wanted to come down with a godlike complex. So what they started to do was they told all of these new people that they had to be on their uh, best behavior, for lack of a better word. And uh, if they weren't, they would pretty much get axed. And so that put a lot of them on ice, and they didn't know what was happening. So what happened was a lot of the supervisors, the, the management team, they would kind of be antagonistic towards the regular new people. And I kind of was in the position of somewhat of the middleman spot, and I kind of said, this isn't something that we should be doing. We need to, uh, you know, let them just do their job. They have to learn this on their own. They've never uh, done this thing before. And they were very up their own ass about it. It was very unfortunate. Well, what ended up happening was that these new people were constantly just getting in trouble. And they were being told by their group leader, uh, their, their supervisor, if you will, about their job that they were doing. But they weren't doing it that well which was completely false. And so every day I would go into this office and talk to uh, one of my union reps and I would say, hey, this is happening out here. I, I can't like just do this on my own. And I even told the new people, you guys have to go in there and tell them the exact same thing. And no one spoke up. And I was the only one out there trying to protect them. And at some point, I just had to leave. And I would like to say that things got better, but they didn't. One person, or one person's voice, I should say, can't really fix the issue. It needs to be a collective. That's just what it is. Now, as far as the non-disclosure part of this, where they sign these contracts to not work with other companies, freelance work is tough. But if they sign the contract to work for a dollar a page, then unfortunately that's on them. I'm not trying to be cynical about this, but looking at what they sign, if these people had a representative available to look over these documents before they sign... This could potentially be avoided. An agent or an attorney or somebody could help them with this. Not least of all because while employees of Futekia, for example, can talk about their work and put it on their resume, Amimaru freelancers just can't do that. And that leads me to the next problem I want to discuss, and that's credit. More specifically, the occasional lack thereof. Why is this a segment in this video? Is it because you're going to tell me how people moving to Los Angeles where rent can be around $1,300 for a studio apartment, the typeset pages for no more than $280 is my fault? Because I don't like localizations? Uh, oh, that's right, I'm assuming things. Sorry about that, continue. For bureaucratic reasons that uncoincidentally never seem to be spelled out plainly, it's not unheard of for some projects, such as Amimaru's, to just not credit their translators, which really strikes me as weird, because they're arguably the most important cog in the bringing Japanese media to other countries machine. I've heard speculation on potential reasons why this happens, but in the absence of any hard evidence pointing to any of them, I don't want to dwell on any of these theories for too long at the risk of detracting from the main point which is that rules like this are already absurd enough on their own, but they're somehow even worse when the translators don't even know for sure why they're being implemented in the first place. Usually rules or things that are written up are a result of something happening prior. So in the case that maybe someone worked for a translation or a localization team for a company, if they were to reveal those secrets, then that's probably why they won't let them just go anywhere and say anything where someone could say for Sega for instance they could say well I localize for them and their process is this this and this and then if they go to like a uh, Nisa or NIS America then they can do the same thing and it's selling insider secrets perhaps even weirder is the fact that there's even some projects that flat out don't let their translators talk about their involvement on social media or put it on their resume. Why won't they let them do this? Again, bureaucratic reasons that never seem to be explicitly spelled out. At the risk of sounding too cynical or to sound like I'm defending the company, if you sign the contract and that's what it says, then that's how it goes. Unfortunately, I wish in my own brain of brains, that if a person is doing work on something, then they should be credited. 
that's just how uh, you should operate as a person or maybe as a company, in my opinion. But again, if they write it that way, you don't have to partake in it. But on the flip side, if you really enjoy something that you love doing and you're not being credited for it, even knowing the risk that you may not be credited for it, it's still a pretty heart sinking feeling. And speaking of saying things plainly, I want to emphasize something real quick just to make sure we're on the same page here. While this is a problem we know exists within Amimaru, it's not a problem exclusive to Amimaru. It's just that, like the Crunchyroll example I just mentioned, Amimaru represents a particularly egregious case. I can only say this until I'm blue in the face, but that's not a consumer problem. That's an industry problem. Much like the video game industry, it's not my problem that Riot Games sexually harasses their workers and people keep going there to work. While I unfortunately can't go into specifics to protect my sources, I can at least tell you that I spoke to plenty of people who've never done any work for Amimaru that have nonetheless encountered this exact same problem, but from other companies. I wouldn't necessarily call this problem super prominent within the translation industry, like, it's definitely not as prominent as the low pay trend, since for the most part that's an industry-wide problem, but the fact that this problem with credit exists just in general, and that it's not even like an isolated issue or something, you know, right off the bat, that's a problem. Much like the people that came before the translators that we have now and the localizers, you have to understand something, that these people don't just appear out of nowhere and things don't just get bad by virtue. There's something that always goes wrong, usually it's with the wrong people. In any case, every single person I spoke to for this video got into the translation industry because they were interested in Japanese media. Every single one loves what they do, and some of them become some of the biggest fans of the projects they work on. Could you imagine putting all those hours into translating a single project and then just not being able to see your name on it anywhere and also not being allowed to talk about it, let alone put it on your resume? Yeah, if you think that sounds scummy and, in the words of Steiner, fully engineered to prevent career advancement, then congratulations! You're correct. Don't sign contracts for bad companies. I myself like streaming on Twitch, uh, th right there, as you can see, but I won't sign a contract that says I can't use other sites for anything else. As you can imagine, it's tricky for some translators to be in positions to talk about this issue, and between that and the vague at best reasons why it's even happening in the first place, it's hard to say what the remedy to this situation is. The remedy is don't make deals with the devil. That being said, I don't think it would hurt if people started vocally appreciating translators more and emphasizing that they'd like to hear them talk more about their work and getting credited for it. The problem is, again, they're stuck signing papers that say they can't talk about it, even then, the ones that are probably the most accessible in places like Twitter, let's be real, are kind of shitheads to people that slightly give them pushback. So I don't see that ever really being the case unless you uh, suck up to them. And I'm not sucking up to them. That quote is made by someone who's definitely in the localization Illuminati. I'm a medievalist, so I can tell you from experience that translation discourse spans back further than you can even imagine. And likewise, it'll probably continue to stick around in some form or fashion for the foreseeable future. Well, that's good then, because then we can still continue to vote with our wallets. Also, since we're going to be a little bit of a historian, let's go ahead and look at the most famous translation, which is the Bible, being translated into English and then printed dating all the way back to 1535, and you can even see throughout the entire years that it's ever existed, I would say decades, maybe centuries, you can see that there's a bunch of different versions that have different translations. Some say money and others say mammon, which also translates to money. But again, if you read through the different versions of the Bible, then you can tell these discrepancies pretty easily. And here's just a and just an example that I found on the Cambridge website, which you can also look at, also link in the description. Which is why, I think, it's especially important for us to have a good understanding of what translation, localization, and censorship really are and aren't. You have barely made any attempt to get your point across, and you've smacked down any attempt by having bad faith in most, if not all, of this video. We pointed out what you don't know and why your arguments are trash. In fact, I hardly swore in this video, so I could sound at least a little intelligent. 
Translation is a much more fluid thing than a lot of people give it credit for. And by extension, the people whose job it is to make these translations often don't get the credit they deserve. Literally, even, sometimes. Let's go through this one more time. If they aren't getting credited, that's their fault for signing the paper that says it. <laughs> I guess what I'm hoping you got out of this video was a better understanding of why translation is often a complex process, a better understanding of why translation things happen the way that they do sometimes, and perhaps most crucially, I really hope that this has given you a newfound appreciation for the people who translate Japanese media. We appreciate these people, whether it be directly or indirectly. If their names don't show up, that's not our fault. I mean, I hate it for them, but companies that do this should be restructured. But one or two people in the crowd of thousands won't change the mind of big corporation. Here's a quote from Noel S. I think it really captures what I'm hoping what this video has taught you. Quote, Translation isn't a one-to-one -one process. It's literally writing a whole new script, one that is based on, but still separate from, the original. You're consuming the ideas, not the words, of someone else. And how those ideas get brought over is transferred through the lens of the translator, making them as important as the author. This quote uses translation when they meant localization. Because again, definitions. But in any case, since we're already here at the end, let's go ahead and run down some things. So don't trust the industry insiders because a lot of them are going to lie to you straight to your face, or specifically the ones that want to get into that in-group. A lot of localizations that happen to come out are usually botched, and the people that make them celebrate the job that they're doing to make sure that they're getting rid of the incel chuds. And that way they don't have to take any of the criticism because they're antagonistic towards the people. But I digress because, again, these people are very rare. They're not emblematic of everyone, but they certainly don't make the case any better. Two things before I go. One of them is thank you for the YouTube members and the Patreon supporters, including Raymond Ortega, who is a Patreon and a YouTube member, and also to Pokemon Red 12, and also to my man hey i'm turtle so thank you guys for your wonderful contributions to the the great content and if you want to you can also hit the join button or go to patreon for more uh, good quality things and speaking of good quality things if you've noticed underneath here in the the little description thing i am now sponsored by artesian builds the people that make computers i know it's great right Artesian Builds is a grassroots company that's built over thousands of PCs for clients since establishing back in 2018, and they have experts on call nearly 24-7 to provide assistance, and they also help their customers pick the most optimal system for them, and that means that you can message them directly and get help for any build that you may want with their system starting at just $13.94, the ability to go even lower with discounts. One of the best benefits is that you can see your PC be built live at twitch.tv forward slash artesian builds, where you can see them put everything together. And if contributions come in like gifted subs, then your computer gets upgraded. And all you have to do is just click that link down below. And then you'll also have to just put in promo code necro underscore 13. And then I also get a little bit of that money too. Full disclosure, so I guess hashtag ad. So just head to artesianbuilds.com and if you use the link and the code below, then you'll get a special discount up to $100 off.